sleek and distinctive, stylish and modern, truly breathtaking. There was a time when those words weren't commonly associated with the name Rover, except by its most fervent supporters. But today, things are very different. In fact, those comments were the reactions of impartial groups of people throughout Europe who were recently invited to preview our exciting new car, the new Rover 400, the first in a range of cars to take us forward to the millennium. Those same people had other complimentary things to say. Prestigious and luxurious. A thoroughbred. Very desirable. Oh, they were most impressed, and you will be too, when you've had the chance to see it. The existing 400 is being phased out. A new Rover 400 series is being introduced, comprising initially three five-door models. A 1.4 K-series and a new 1.6 K-series, both with manual transmissions, and a 1.6 Honda-engined car with automatic transmission. The new 400 is being targeted to appeal to business users and families alike, and more versions are scheduled soon. So, let's see what it's got that impressed those impartial previewers so much. First, its outward appearance. There's no question that its modern, prestigious styling is distinctly Rover, and its elegance and refinement tell us it's British. Under the skin, the new Rover 400 is built to world-class standards of quality and reliability. For example, during assembly, each body is subjected to an unprecedented 700-point dimensional check to ensure the greatest accuracy of build. The Rover 400 is robust and solidly built to last. Among the interesting external features are the distinctive Rover grille, the moulded headlamp and direction indicator lenses made of a crack-resistant material, a visible display of the VIN number to deter the thieves, and bolt-on bumper cans behind the bumpers to absorb minor impacts. When alloy wheels are specified, they'll have locking wheel nuts. Once inside the car, you'll be impressed by the inbuilt quality all around you, and trim levels to suit all tastes and pockets. Among the standard features are a tilt-adjust steering column and an electrically operated sunroof on all models. We'll look at the airbag systems in a minute. But first, it's worth noting that the front seat belts incorporate web lockers. In the event of an accident, they reduce the amount of webbing payout before the inertia reel locks. A height adjustable driver's seat is fitted as standard from SI models upwards, as are electric front windows and electrically controlled and heated door mirrors. SLI models have electric windows at the rear too. The comprehensive instrument panel displays everything the driver needs to know. On automatic transmission cars, it even has a quadrant display to indicate the gear position selected, so there's no need to look down to check. The radio cassette unit, fitted in the centre console, is an exciting new development. Two versions are specified, the R760 and the R860. On both versions, the display is combined with the clock above it, and has three modes. Full clock, when the radio is off, full radio, when a radio feature is selected, and an abbreviated radio plus clock. In this third mode, the time is displayed on the right, and the left and lower areas of the display indicate the radio state. This mode is automatically selected after about 10 seconds in the full radio mode. The top of the range R860 has all the features you could expect, Dolby, music search, and so on, and it has the capability for the optional CD system. On all radios, a four-digit security code is issued with the vehicle documentation, and a unique identification number is engraved here. If the power supply to the radio is broken, it will not work until the correct security code is entered. This is how you do it on the R760 model. Turn the ignition on, and then alternately use the preset button 1 and the up or down tuning button. The preset button selects the first, second, third and fourth digits of the code in turn, and the up-down button is used to enter the appropriate digit when selected. After entering the fourth digit, press preset button 1 again. If the correct code has been entered, the unit will sound an OK beep, and then start operating normally. If the code is entered incorrectly, the unit will sound an error beep, and the display will show wait. Leave the ignition on, wait until the display changes to code, and try again. Incidentally, the waiting time is doubled each time an incorrect code is entered. 
If the radio code is not active, the display will show Rover when it's switched on. It's not recommended that the radio is used like this because it'll not be protected if it's stolen. To activate the code, switch the radio off, then press the up button and keep it pressed while switching the radio on. The display will show Rover. Release the up button, the display will change to code, sound an OK beep and then operate normally. If you have to disconnect the power supply for any reason, you can deactivate the radio security code like this. Switch the radio off, press the up tuning button and keep it depressed while switching the radio on. The display will show Rover. Release the up tuning button and the display will now show code. So enter the four digit code as we showed you a moment ago. The unit will then give you the OK beep but you must remember it's no longer protected and must be reactivated as soon as possible. Three types of airbag system are fitted to the new 400. Standard fitment on Rover engine models is a Rover system fitted on the driver's side only. A different Rover system is used when the optional passenger fitment is required. The Honda engine model uses the Honda SRS3 system with airbags fitted as standard on both the driver's and passenger's sides. The SRS warning light is located in the steering wheel on the driver-only airbag system and in the instrument pack on the others. On the Rover system, it'll come on for about three seconds when the ignition is switched on and then go out to indicate the system's working correctly. On the Honda system, it comes on for about six seconds. Operation of the Rover systems is similar to the previous 400. On the single airbag system, the diagnostic control unit is located behind the airbag in the steering wheel. And if a fault develops, the SRS light will come on to warn the driver. On the other two systems, the diagnostic control unit is located behind the center console. And the service check connector for the SRS3 is under the fascia on the passenger's side. The SRS warning light will flash its diagnostic trouble code as before. Next, we'll look at the security system. The new Rover 400 offers perimetric, volumetric and engine immobilization, all under the control of the door key or an RF remote handset, just like the previous 400. Whenever the vehicle is locked, the hazard warning lights will give three quick flashes. And these red LEDs next to the sill buttons will flash quickly for 10 seconds and then flash slowly. If a miss lock is detected, the hazard warning lights will not flash. Passive immobilization has now been added to provide even greater security. It immobilizes the engine even if the user forgets to lock the car. Approximately 30 seconds after the ignition is switched off and the driver's door is opened, the LEDs in the door will flash and the engine will be automatically immobilized. In this condition, when the ignition is turned on, the warning buzzer will sound to let the driver know. Press either button on the handset to remobilize the engine. Incidentally, the security system is protected by a rolling code. Each time the authentic handset is used, the alarm ECU changes its code. So the car thieves with the code breaking equipment will be out of luck. Like the previous 400, a multifunction unit, or MFU, is fitted to control a number of electrical functions. It's located here, behind the passenger compartment fuse box. Among the functions under the control of the MFU are the front and rear wipers, the courtesy light delay and fader, and the lights on alarm. The alarm will sound if the side lights are on, the ignition is switched off, and the driver's door is opened. Other functions controlled by the MFU are the heated rear window timer, the horn relay, headlamp dim dip control, rear fog lamp control, and the engine immobilization active sounder. Remember, once that operates, the engine must be remobilized using the handset or the emergency key access code. An onboard self-test allows you to check the MFU. Enter it like this. Hold in the heated rear window switch, turn the ignition on, and release the heated rear window switch within eight seconds. If you've done it right, the MFU will signal OK. You can now use the heated rear window switch to check the various functions in turn. And you'll find full details in the workshop manual. Now let's look under bonnet. As we said before, three power unit options are available initially. 
a 1.4 and a new 1.6 K-series, both with 16 valves and a 1.6 16-valve Honda engine. We'll examine the K-series first. You'll be familiar with the engine, which, since its introduction in 1989, has built up an excellent reputation. Few changes have been introduced. Externally, you can see the new inlet manifold, introduced in 1994, made of a plastic compound. It provides a weight reduction and allows accuracy of design. Internally, a major change on the 1.6 engine concerns the cylinder liners. The 1.4 has wet liners, but this design limits our ability to enlarge the bores of the engine. So, the answer which our engineers have come up with is the ingenious idea of liners that are part wet and part dry. Someone called them damp liners, and the name has caught on. As you can see here, they seal about halfway down. So only the upper half has coolant directly in contact with the outside of the liner. The lower half is a sliding fit in the block. This concept not only reduces engine drag and gives a more rapid warm-up, but it has also allowed us to increase the bore size for the 1.6 engine with reliability. The result of this is an exciting power output of 111 PS and a maximum torque of 145 Newton meters on the 1.6 unit. Liner sealing is all important. The 1.4 engine still has these O-ring seals at the bottom. But on the 1.6, the liner is sealed by a bead of hylomar on this ledge down in the block. It does mean that a new special tool, 18G 1736-1, is necessary to hold the liners in position whenever the cylinder head is removed. Otherwise, the liners might move and break the seal if the engine is turned over. If that does happen, then the liners must be removed and the interfaces cleaned and resealed with Hylomar. New ultra-lightweight pistons are also fitted to the 1.6 engine. They reduce inertia forces and improve quietness and smoothness of running. Fuel and ignition control is taken care of by a MEMS management system, which is the latest development of the MEMS system used on the previous K-series engine. There are a number of significant differences. A dry coil is now used, mounted here on the engine. And the crankshaft sensor multiplug is connected directly onto the sensor. The reluctor on the flywheel, which the sensor reads from, has also changed. It now has two additional offset missing poles, which enables the ECM to recognize number one TDC. These K-series engines use multipoint fuel injection. And the major new feature here is that instead of all the injectors firing simultaneously, they're now grouped in pairs, one and four, two and three. In this new system, both pairs fire together during cranking to provide the necessary fuel enrichment. Then when the engine's running, the pairs fire alternately, thus providing greater efficiency and improved emission levels. The electronic control module, or ECM, is mounted on the bulkhead directly behind the engine. And this relay module is also located on the bulkhead directly behind the ECM. It contains the main relay, fuel pump relay, starter motor relay, and oxygen sensor relay. Diagnosis of the MEMS 1.9 system as fitted to the Rover 400 is carried out using test book connected to the vehicle via this 16-way connector. The Honda 1.6 engine is virtually the same as the engine you've seen before in the Rover 216 and 416 and uses the programmed fuel injection engine management system PGM-FI. Engine adjustments and overhaul procedures are unchanged and only two new special tools have been introduced. 18G1737 holds the crankshaft from turning when undoing the crankshaft pulley bolt and adapter 18G1354-18 stroke is used to install the crankshaft rear oil seal into its housing. On the Honda engine, the engine control module, or ECM, is located here in the passenger footwell. The main relay, which provides power to the ECM and the fuel pump relay, is behind the fascia on the right-hand side, midway up the A-post. The inertia switch is behind the center console. The service check connector is located here behind the glove box and this malfunction indicator light in the instrument panel will blink the diagnostic trouble code. So, let's look at some of the detail changes that have been made to the PGMFI system. The injectors are now supplied with power direct from the main relay, and their resistance is now between 10 and 13 ohms. The manifold absolute pressure sensor is mounted to the top of the throttle body.
and you'll notice that a throttle dash pot is not fitted. Another bit of simplification is to the air intake resonator. Electrical control is not needed, and we have a simple mechanical system. The fast idle thermo valve is now a wax stat design, sensitive to coolant temperature. It isn't adjustable, but you can check whether it's working by putting your finger over this hole in the throttle body. There should be noticeable air suction while the engine is warming up. Incidentally, the PGMFI also controls the torque converter lockup feature. Diagnosis of the PGMFI system is carried out using Testbook via the microcheck emulation feature. Another new feature you can see under bonnet is this unique hydraulic clutch. The master cylinder and the slave cylinder are supplied with a length of interconnecting pipe. They're pre-filled with fluid and then sealed. The two units are supplied as one assembly. The only part available separately is this pushrod retainer. If at any time you need to split the interconnecting pipes at this connection, you'll need special tool 18G 1593 to separate them. After reconnecting the pipes, all you have to do is pump the clutch pedal a few times to eliminate any air from the system. Incidentally, two other points while we're under bonnet. If you're looking for the dim dip resistor on a Rover 1.4 or 1.6K model, it's here, below the battery tray. And the engine bay fuse box is here in this corner. On the K-series engined models, power is transmitted to the road wheels via an uprated version of the well-known R65 manual transmission to take the additional power from the 1.6 engine. It has cast bronze alloy selector forks, this snap ring on the output shaft bearing to act as an additional thrust plate and a stronger method of retaining the final drive gear on the differential carrier. There's also a stake nut to secure fifth gear on the input shaft. Overhaul procedures are similar to the earlier R65 unit and use the same special tools. All Honda engine cars use a four-speed automatic transmission. Outwardly, it looks like the unit previously fitted on 216 and 416 models, but internally it is different. It incorporates this new subshaft, in addition to the conventional main shaft and counter shaft. The subshaft locates the first hold clutch and first and fourth gears. Fluid level checking and the shift cable adjustment are the same as before, but overhaul procedures are different and you'll find the information you need in the workshop manual. Now let's have a look at the all-important suspension, steering and brakes. We'll start with the suspension. The new Rover 400 retains the traditional configuration of double wishbones at the front and a multi-link system at the rear, controlled by coil springs with hydraulic dampers. Considerable attention has been paid to fine-tune the whole suspension system by specifying springs, dampers and anti-roll bars to suit each model variant and enhance its performance. Everyone who drives the car is most impressed by its ride and road holding qualities. From a service viewpoint, you'll be familiar with most suspension procedures, but there is an important point which you must be aware of if you're working on the front suspension lower arms. They must never be dismantled, except to replace these bushings. These two fixings have been torque tightened at the factory whilst under a specific loading and must never be taken out. And talking of service procedures, the rear wheel alignment is adjustable as before, but don't forget, each rear wheel is aligned independently of the other. So if you are checking alignment, you must deal with each wheel separately. It should be an angle of 11 minutes toe-in per wheel. Next, the steering. Power steering is fitted as standard on all models. The rack is a conventional design. A Hoborn Eaton pump supplies the necessary fluid pressure. Pump drive belt tension and pressure testing procedures are the same as before, but you must use Unipart GGL 282 fluid at all times for topping up or renewal purposes. Now the braking system. The brakes themselves vary from model to model, dependent on the specification. The two Rover engined models have solid disc front brakes and drum brakes at the rear while the Honda engined car has ventilated discs at the front and solid discs at the rear. The disc brake calipers are the collette type, and the master cylinder and servo assembly specification depends on whether anti-lock brakes are fitted or not. Anti-lock braking is available as an option on all these models. 
Whenever ABS is fitted, ventilated discs are specified at the front and solid discs at the rear. The anti-lock braking is a new Bosch ABS-5 system, so let's look at it in more detail. The combined modulator and ECU assembly is mounted here on the left-hand side of the engine bay. The two halves can be taken apart, and the ECU and relay half is available as a separate item. The modulator isn't. It can only be obtained complete with the ECU and relay assembly. Incidentally, the two relays are permanently fixed in the ECU. They cannot be taken out. If you have to remove the modulator for any reason, don't forget to connect this pump earth wire when you refit it. It's vital to the correct functioning of the modulator, and always check its security if you're trying to rectify an ABS problem. The wheel sensors are similar to other models and work in the same way. There is one important difference, however. The pulsar rings on the new 400 have 43 teeth, whereas the pulsar rings on the earlier ABS-2E system have only 27 teeth. They must not be interchanged, as the related components are not compatible, even if they do fit. The most important difference in this ABS-5 system lies in the modulator, which has a new method of controlling the pressure phases to the calipers. As before, each front wheel is individually sensed and controlled. The rear wheels are individually sensed, but controlled jointly by the select low principle. But it's the way the pressure's controlled that is the new feature. On the ABS-2 and ABS-2E systems, the solenoid valves are three position valves and are current controlled. The ABS-5 system uses a separate inlet and outlet valve for each wheel fluid line. They are voltage controlled, which means each valve is either open or closed during actuation. This illustration shows the system as it applies to one of the wheels. In the de-energized position, this inlet valve is open and the outlet valve is closed. And during normal braking, fluid pressure from the master cylinder will flow through the open inlet valve to apply the brake. If the ECU senses that the wheel is likely to lock, it will close the inlet valve. The outlet valve is still closed, so the pressure already in the caliper is isolated and maintained at the same level. If the ECU detects that the wheel is still likely to lock, it will keep the inlet valve closed, signal the outlet valve to open, and start up the return pump. This allows fluid to be pumped away from the caliper and take the brake off to avoid wheel lock. When the wheel speed increases, the ECU de-energizes both valves to allow them to return to their original status and the brake will be reapplied. A noticeable benefit of this ABS-5 system is that although pedal pulsations are still apparent, they are much less so in comparison with previous systems. That nearly completes the introductory program on the exciting new Rover 400 range. A final observation that is well worth making is that significant research took place during the development stages of the 400 to reduce noise, vibration and harshness to a minimum. In addition to the considerable amount of acoustic padding you'll notice throughout the car, much attention has been paid to the more basic causes. For example, the body structure has been carefully designed to minimize cavity resonance, or body boom as it is commonly called. Then the engine's been moved 75 millimetres further away from the bulkhead when compared with the previous 400. Also, the seals around the door and window areas have been subject to rigorous quality standards to ensure a perfect fit. The new Rover 400, a car that is destined to set new standards for family or business motoring. We're sure you'll be impressed too. Thank you for watching.